<laughs> Laughter is the best medicine, and now there's science behind it. <laughs> be yourself, be true to yourself, and don't try to be something you're not. <laughs> What a fantastic resource with so many people with so many stories to share. Welcome to Elder Wisdom Stories from the Green Bench, a podcast from the heart, an idea that began at Schlegel Village's retirement and long-term care homes, and it's all about talking with and about seniors. I'm Erin Davis. My co-host today, as always, is Lloyd Hetherington. He's a husband, father, and grandfather, and a widower. Lloyd's a teacher and a missionary, and like so many fellow seniors at Schlegel Village's retirement and long-term care homes in Ontario, he has a lot of stories to tell, wisdom to share, and yeah, questions to ask. Lloyd joins us on the Green Bench. It's a place for rest and reflection, a place to ask questions and offer advice. Upon it, even if only for a moment, the world can stop turning and we can find a connection. And today, we're connecting you with a woman named Judy Stefnitz. Now, Judy's had a varied and fascinating life with plenty of ups and downs, but she's come through shining and has a lot of elder wisdom to share on the green bench. She's a resident of the village of Tansley Woods, and she joins Lloyd and me here today to talk about taking a chance for a dance, nursing, parenting with challenges, and so much more. Have a seat. Hey, Judy, welcome to the Green Bench. It's such a pleasure to have you here from Burlington today. Thank you. Erin, I feel so privileged to be invited, so I thank you. Well, I guess there's another thank you on the way to you for the career that you had, because as you probably know, the World Health Organization designated 2020 as the International Year of the Nurse and Midwife. And since it seems like this new year is just like an NBA basketball game with extra time that just keeps being added on, it's only appropriate that we take a moment to salute you, too, in your role and your life as a nurse, as a counselor, as a Eucharist minister and a lay parish minister, you are having a very interesting life, and we look forward to just diving right into it. Well, I want you to know that I'm also the mother of four and the grandmother of eight. Well, that's an accomplishment, and I know that you and Lloyd could exchange proud parent and grandparent stories as well. Okay, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right off the bat, we can tell that you have a really positive attitude and a, sort of a joie de vivre. Tell us what keeps you going now at 81 and what gets you out of bed in the morning, Judy, would you? Well, my best response is that I love life. So I have a plan for every day that is not carved in stone because I learned very early that it changes quickly with no warning. So I always have something to look forward to. I'm always grateful for the end of the day. And here I am. Breakfast is usually first, but I should tell you that I do a program that I pay for on my tablet, and it's brain exercises in all different facets of life language and planning and just everything. It's got about 15 different games, they call them, but each one is assessing your own ability in different areas. Fortunately for me, my main effort or reward is in problem solving. So here I sit. <laughs> Good. Maybe I'll talk to you. Do you charge for counseling? Because, you know, <laughs> we can all use a good listener these days. Well, I can tell you that my kids said, Mom, just go for everything because you do it for nothing. It's who you are. And that is very much Lloyd's mantra, too. I don't want to put words in your mouth, Lloyd, but you also are very active in keeping your brain engaged and interested and in words and all of that. And perhaps that's something that you can share with Judy. I do play Scrabble on my computer. and uh, I play Scrabble every morning. Is that right? With my husband, yeah. Oh, I, w I wish I had a partner like that. Uh, I was going to say, you want to play with me, Judy, but I guess your husband would object. 
No, he would not. I have to tell you that uh, I have the most wonderful husband in the world because I have all the freedom that I need. And he said to me just before he left, he gave me a kiss. He said, I'm proud of you. Have fun. Hey, marvelous, marvelous. They don't make many marriages like that anymore. Well, after 58 years, we've learned how to make it work. Uh Wow. (laughs) No expiry date on your wedding certificate then. (laughs) <laughs> I love that line from you, Lloyd, and yeah. I think about it often because you're right. Now, you married how many years ago again? 58. It will be 59 this 59 year. 59 years. Marvelous. Yes. And were you working for many of those years in your marriage? Tell us about your career, Judy. Well, I uh, went into nursing when I was 16 years old, and I met my husband in the beginning of my second year, and I worked afterwards in pediatrics in Welland. We met at a church dance on a Sunday night, like a Paul Jones. Do you know what that is? No. Oh, well, that was a dance way back when, where the guys were on the outside of the circle and the girls were on the inside of the circle. And wherever the music stopped, you introduced yourself to that person. Oh, So you had a chance for a dance, and you could decide what you wanted to do or not. Then after we got married, we moved to Toronto and uh, lived in an apartment on St. George Street, and I worked at Sick Children's on the cardiac unit for newborns to two years old and got pregnant in the interim, no surprise. And I actually left Sick Children's to go on private duty registry because I got paid more since I knew my working days were limited. Mm -hmm. And they paid me private duty rates to come back to Sick Children's, which was humbling to say the least. So after Mike was born at uh, St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto, he was about a year old and we moved to Oakville and bought our first home. And there I um, got pregnant again. And after our second son was born, I went back to work when he was four months old at the Oakville Hospital Relief. They wanted me to do pediatrics. And I said, you know what? I have a two-year-old son and I can't deal with the gap, you know? Mm -hmm. It was like I had this kid that was on blood pressure every 15 minutes and an intravenous and all this stuff, and that was okay. Was that your own child? No, no, not my own child. It was sick. The fact that I had a two-year-old at home and this kid was two years old, I just said, let me out of Mm -hmm. here. So I I did relief at the Oakville Hospital for four years, which was awesome because I worked in every ward except emergency. So I've had a broad... Uh, nursing span for my lifetime and then got pregnant again and had a little girl and Paula's 51 today oh. not her birthday today but this time yeah. in life then I had David and believe it or not I didn't do a whole lot of nursing after that because my kids seemed to have health problems oh, no. my first child had convulsions at 11 months old oh, no. uh, like four weeks after my father died so that was kind of traumatic and then Um, while John at five fell off the roof, but before that he had frequent ear infections, always on antibiotics. So his first teeth came in black from all the antibiotics he had. Oh, (laughs) So at five years old, he fell off the roof. So that was another. Okay. You got to tell us the story of a five-year-old on the roof. Well, Norm was painting the house, and he didn't put the ladder away. Oh, <laughs> uh-huh. and a five-year-old will this. find his way. Think about this. So the irony of this, and I thank God for this every day, he was with a friend on that garage roof. Okay. And thank you, God, John fell off of it, mm. and his friend did not. Wow. I'm in the house with the hairdryer on, and life's going on beautifully, and all of a sudden I hear screams, and John has actually ripped his lower jaw away from the jaw. Oh, good. And uh, gravel marks on between his nose and his mouth and on hmm. his forehead. So I shoved a towel in his mouth, and off we went to the Oakville Hospital. And this is not a joke. They knew me so well that when I went there, that say, okay, Mrs. Stefanitz, what is it today? <laughs> oh, and, and I'm not complaining. That was wonderful because, you know, it helps if they know who you oh, are. For sure. Yeah, so that was John. And then Paula, 
uh, at 11 months, had an extremely rare allergic reaction where all her skin fell off. Oh, goodness. From her head to her toe. What was she allergic to? Long story short, they told me that it was uh, penicillin. I said, she hasn't had any penicillin. Uh Well, then it's aspirin. I said, I only gave her aspirin at 5 o'clock this morning because I couldn't settle her down. Uh And long story short, when my own doctor came back, he said it was a virus. Goodness. But very rare called Stevens-Johnson syndrome. I had done pediatric nursing for a long time and had never heard of it. So then my last child had asthma. So we spent a lot of time in Children's Hospital in Montreal because we moved to Montreal when David was 18 months old. He was our last born. Mm -hmm. So all of that stuff was going on in Montreal. So I had a route to sick kids and went through the whole process of swelling and rashes and allergies. And goodness. Now they're all grown up and alive. My eldest son is 58. The second one is 56, but he's had two brain tumors. So we've worked through that. He has two kids, uh, 23 and 21. The 21-year-old is going through a cancer fight of his own right now. And um, our eldest son has two boys, and they're both working. They're all working through this pandemic. I am so grateful. Wow. And then... um, what can I say to you? That uh, My youngest son has two boys. We only have two granddaughters, or a granddaughter who is 23 and a 16-year-old. So what else do you want to know? <laughs> wow, that is some story. And we're not even into the part where, and you've mentioned it, you moved to Montreal, Judy. How did that happen? Was that your husband's career? What, what was he in? And, and how did you come to move to La Belle Provence? Well, he uh, was an investment counselor, and he worked at Babson's in Toronto when I first met him and had been there all this time. So our lives have been quite stable aside from the health stuff. But, you know, that just seemed to be okay for me, if you know what I'm saying. Mm. It just went with the territory. So came home one day, and, and often in the spring he'd get, uh, you know, restless and, hey, Jude, do you want to move? And maybe I should look for a new job. And one day I said, you know what, if you want a new job, do something about it. If you don't, I don't want to hear it. So he came home one day and he said, hey, Jude, how would you like to move to Montreal? And after a moment of shock, I said, you know what, I will make home wherever we are. Mm. And that's certainly telling the story of the time, okay? And we're talking about what, like the 1960s or 70s there? Uh, Help us chronologically, Judy. Okay, so we got married in 62. This was 1972. Okay. And we moved to Montreal after the FLQ crisis. Right. So we lived in a lovely home in Montreal. We were in Beaconsfield, so we were not really a part of all the unrest in Quebec. Mm -hmm. But the biggest shock to me came when all four kids now were in school, and I'm thinking, yay, I can go back to nursing. I could not get licensed in Quebec because I did not speak French. I had to take a French exam. So I said, okay, time for a new direction. And it's amazing how life works. You know, I'm reading the paper one morning and saw this notice. If, If family life is important to you, Concordia University is offering a new program. If you're interested, call this lady. Well, because of my experience, it was like, go for it. So I went and spoke with this lady. She was overjoyed that I wanted to be in the program. I was 38 years old. I had had some experiences at a a summer camp with young people from 16 to 22. And the fellow who ran it was a psychologist. And I thought, you know, maybe I should study psychology. Maybe that would be a good place to start. So I met with this fellow, who today is a Monsignor in the Catholic Church, believe it or not. He said, Judy, you don't want to go into psychology. It's very limiting. He said, your life experience already gives you more skills than a lot of people with many degrees. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay. So when I saw this article in the paper, it was kind of like, do you know what? This makes everything I've done credible because I have a piece of paper. 
And the exciting part for me was that I was 38 years old. I was still learning. Mm -hmm. And that's where I am today at 81. Oh, you're on the right track there, Judy. When we stop learning, we start dying. Keep your mind sharp. Pursue knowledge for its own sake. And the beauty of it is you set your own agenda now. You set your own curriculum. But do you know what? Life is the curriculum. Mm. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So as it happens to me, I'm always finding new ways. I'm always ready to go in another direction. Uh -huh. So I know that uh, nothing's carved in stone. And, and a phone call told me that my mother was dead. A phone call told me that my father was dead. A phone call told me my twin brother was dead, my half-brother was dead, my half-sister was dead. So very, very early, I learned that the telephone is a wonderful instrument for many, many things. Right, mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Not the most of all could be change. And believe me, I do not spend my life, every time the phone rings, I don't say, oh, God, what's this going to be? Uh -huh. yeah. I've never chosen that route. Never, ever. I'm excited every time the phone rings. Now, correct me, Judy, if I'm wrong, but it seems like you were a woman ahead of your time in terms of women's reproductive rights and the need for sex education for youth. Where did that come from in you? And how did you use your beliefs and the education and knowledge and experience that you had amassed? In all seriousness, I was talking to my husband about this the other day, and I said, you know, where did all this stuff come from? Because I certainly didn't have a lot of experience in anything. But his comment was, it was innate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so if, if the opportunity presents itself, then I respond. When I was taking the family life education program at Concordia, it was a two-year program that I took in four years because I still volunteered in the community. I still had four kids and I was still going to school. So in the process of that, a whole lot of things were happening in my life, too. And one of the things that I had to do in order to get my certificate, because it was the first program, it wasn't a degree, which I'm sure it is now, because that was, what, 45 years ago or something? Yeah, um, yeah. But my practicum, which is what I had to do to graduate, I had to do the research, the planning, the organizing, the facilitating, and the presentation and the rewards for that program. So... Family life taught me to look at all the issues from womb to tomb. Mm. And then I chose to look at them in response to social networks that I was observing. So my practicum was helping parents to be sex educators. And it is import as important today as it was then because everybody runs away from it. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. We were so reluctant to share the facts do we let the kids pick up the fiction from wherever? Yeah. Well, do you know what I think happened? I think parents did not understand that they did not have to tell their kids their own experience. They didn't know there was something else they could tell their mm -hmm. kids that would accommodate that without anything about intercourse or intimacy or any of that stuff. And I found out that the reality of that is teaching them values and attitudes and respect and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So my secret is that attitude is our greatest power, and we control that for ourselves. Our job as parents is to teach our kids mm -hmm. those things. And if they respect themselves and respect their partners, my kids never got anybody pregnant or any of those horrific ha-ha-ha things of the time. Right. So I, I think the, the reason for my doing that was to kind of say to parents, listen, don't be afraid to teach your kids goodness and respect, mm -hmm. because I think that's the difference. Do you have those talks with your own eight grandkids? Or is it kind of like, oh, grandma, no. No, do you know what? Uh, 
and, and this is the truth. I'm not always consciously aware of what happens with my grandkids because, again, I simply respond <laughs> to whatever's happening. I know uh, when I was 80, my granddaughter made me a beautiful uh, book from all of my children and grandchildren, pictures from them. And they all said they loved their chats with me mm. and they loved it when I came by. And my youngest grandchild, who just turned 15, he said 10 things I love about Nana. You know, playing this, baking this, doing this, going. Like, wow, Yeah, what a gift that was to me because I had no idea. And even from my own kids, Mom, I am what I am because of you. Mom, I'm so blessed to have you for my mother. Like, holy smokes, where did all this come from? It came from you, Judy. I guess it's because I'm not aware. Mm -hmm. I do not know what people are talking about when they say, I love it when you visit, Judy. I feel like I've been to mm -hmm. church. Huh. What? Good God, we don't talk about God or, or even <laughs> mention church. But... That's the feedback that I get. So I'm very grateful and very humbled. Yeah, Judy, you're not preaching the sermons. You're living them. And that makes such a difference. Amen. No, you're probably right, Lloyd. And I never even thought about that. But because my whole outlook is life, I guess that makes sense, uh -huh. doesn't it? It yeah. does. And you know what? It's the soul of a nurse. It was Val Sainsbury who said nurses dispense comfort, compassion, and caring without even a prescription. What called you to nursing? Because I know that careers were limited at the time that you were choosing your path, but you seem to have a deeper calling than simply tick box A, B, or C, Judy. Well, my mother died when I was four. She was killed in a car accident mm. because she crossed against the light and was run over by a car driven by an 18-year-old kid. Ugh who came home to say goodbye to his grandmother because he was going off to the Second World War. Oh. Now, charges were never laid, but my mother was a nurse. Hello? Yeah. Okay, I don't know if that's it or not, but I wrote a poem, probably 12 verses in my yearbook when I graduated from training, about my desire to quell the pain of men. And I think it was something innate. It was just in me to do this. And I dare say that if you talk to people who know me, that's probably just who I am. It wasn't a choice. It was who I am. There was a poll that was done about a year ago. And for the 18th year in a row, North Americans ranked the nursing profession as number one when it came to honesty and ethical standards. And I think that a career, a life like that, really does attract the best people. And especially now, look what we're seeing now, the health care givers who are parking their own needs and their fears for their families so that they can try and heal us all. It's really quite amazing. Have you imagined yourself, Judy, as a nurse during these times of COVID? Have you said, what would my life be now? No, but I have said, thank you, God, that I'm not nursing anymore. Mm -hmm. Please mm -hmm. protect those who are giving of themselves. But dear heart, remember that when I was nursing, I looked after typhoid fever and staph infections and scarlet fever and, you know, yeah. uh, tuberculosis, mental illness. My goodness. And then, then you sort of segued into counseling. How was it for you to be Instead of hands-on and changing IVs, how did you find it, counseling? What did you get out of that, Judy? It's just something I've always done. Mm. Believe it or not, a friend called me who was a roommate of mine when I was in training. She's in Toronto now. And we are at total opposite poles. I've taken a spiritual tack, not consciously, mm -hmm. But she has consciously taken into the stars and the zodiac and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And she just said to me, Judy, your articles nourish my spiritual life. I said, are you kidding? Wow. Nourish your spiritual life? I said, I, I don't even write anything spiritual. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, that's where I need to be nourished. So what can I say? It speaks to a saying that a doctor of mine had who said that what comes from the heart goes to the heart. 
And while you are a channel for so much goodness, you very actively live out your philosophy about the past and the present. Judy, could you explain that a little bit? Well, what I learned, even at four years old, when my mother was taken from me, is, first of all, I had no control over it. Second of all, I didn't ask for it. Third, I didn't deserve it, but I got it. Mm -hmm. Am I going to carry it for the rest of my life? Absolutely not. What is to be gained by carrying yesterday? If you carry yesterday, you have no time, no room for today. And that's the secret. The only thing you have is today. But we carry all kinds of stuff. We're angry, we're bitter, we're disappointed, and it, it's endless. Everybody can tell their own story. But remember that yesterday is as valuable as a canceled check. And if you recognize that, you're going to say to yourself, well, what am I doing this for? If you're angry all the time, are you going to be good company? Uh -uh. If you're carrying yesterday, are you in tune with today? Can you cherish the moment, which is all you have right now? If you're still carrying stuff from way back, I have not carried anything. And if I find that I am carrying something, I say, you better get rid of that because it's in the way. Mm -hmm. And it's done. It's weighing you down and clipping your wings. Absolutely. Ah. Judy, it's been fantastic talking to you. I needed your inspiration today. You know, the nonsense of COVID it weighs heavily on you. But your spirit, your enthusiasm is just what I needed. Thank you so much, Judy. Well, bless your heart. I'm so grateful for the chance to talk with you. Yeah. Here you are. You're not in nursing, but you're still dispensing vitamin J. So thank you, Judy, for that. <laughs> J for Judy, J for joy. Thank you so, so much. Well, thanks to both of you, and I wish you every success as you continue this. I'm sure many people have contributed and will continue to help us all out. Well, with guests like you, how can we go wrong? Thank you, Judy. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Well, it's time to move on from the green bench and let someone else sit and have a chat. We're going to return on our next episode in another two weeks with the spotlight on a very special man you already know, my partner, Lloyd Hetherington. I hope you'll join Lloyd and me for our next podcast. Please subscribe for additional episodes every two weeks. You'll be notified just as soon as they're up. We invite you to please share your thoughts and opinions on social media using hashtag Elder Wisdom to help others find us on this green bench. Just take a moment to rate and review the Elder Wisdom podcast. And if it's easier, go to elderwisdom.ca to find the link. And while you're there, take the Elder Wisdom pledge. I'm Erin Davis. Lloyd and I thank you for your time. Be well, and your seat on the green bench is ready and waiting. Elder Wisdom, Stories from the Green Bench, is brought to you by Schlegel Villages, a complete continuum of care, offering independent living to long-term care, celebrating and honoring the wisdom of the elder. To learn more about us, please go to our website, schlegelvillages.com.